listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, 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 fellow human. I'm back. I'm still alive, and I hope you are too, or else you're some kind of ghost somehow listening to a podcast. Yes, I'm alive and well, and I'm back recording an episode after about a month of radio silence. So what's been going on? Well, quite a bit, actually. So much that I think it's only appropriate to start this episode with a little news segment. So what's been going on around higherideas.net? Well, first I'd like to draw your attention to Mr. Announcer, who always kindly reminds you to check out higherideas.net, join me on Twitter and YouTube, etc., And for those of you who haven't done that, well, you've missed most of what's happened over the past month, so let me help you out here. First of all, over at higherideas.net, there's a new website design, which is part website, part art project, I would say. Uh, It's where I'm starting to flex my artistic muscle in Season 2. And if you scroll down, you'll see there's some extra decorative content there, which will be growing over time. I'll be adding pieces to that scrolling website Uh, as time progresses, and eventually it's going to become something of a long and inspiring gallery of thoughts and imagery. So that's one reason to keep an eye on higherideas.net. Now another thing you might have missed if you haven't subscribed to me on YouTube is for the first time a video. Yes, I finally finished that animated short I've been working on for months, and it's been posted for maybe half a month now. It's been getting quite a nice response on Vimeo and YouTube combined. It's up to about, I think, 2,000 views together. It's only got a few thumbs and a couple comments, sadly. So if you do check it out, please do leave a message of support. Let me know what you think, your thoughts, or give me a thumb, good or bad, really. Just as long as there's interaction, I'm happy. Now, what else has been going on over here? Well, I've been to Peru. I had a trip to Peru where I spent a week in the deep Amazon jungle having insane experiences and almost going insane myself. I've come back with a story so crazy, so off the wall and and, and amazing that I think the only thing to do is to write a book about it. And in fact, that's what I've been doing. I've been writing a book for the past 15 days, heading over to Starbucks all over the city and being a busy writer, drinking tea and looking at interesting faces while trying to stay focused, writing this incredible tale of my one week in the Amazon. So I think you're pretty well caught up after all that. Do check out the new website design. Do check out the video that I've worked my butt off on. Do comment and subscribe, leave thumbs and ratings, show it to your friends if you like it. You know, just let's get things rolling over at higherideas.net. In season two, let's put a little life in the thing. And with that, Let's move along to a segment I like to call Dissecting Ego. Yes, Dissecting Ego. This is a segment I will be putting into every single episode. I finished season one with a big diatribe about ego, and I mean it. I mean it so much that I'm not going to let you forget it. So, let's dissect a piece of ego today. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in conversation with someone, and they drop a word that you've never heard before, a big complicated word that just sort of makes you stop and wonder, what the heck does that mean? Now what do you do when that happens? I find that most people will just let the person go on speaking and pretend they know, just nod, "Uh uh-huh, of course I know that word. Well, what's behind that reaction is ego. Of course, you don't want to look like a fool, you don't want to look stupid, you don't want to be judged for not knowing what that word is, so you just let it slide and let the person go on speaking. But then what happens? First of all, you're confused, so you stop paying attention to what they're saying for a moment. You disconnect from that person as you're in your mind just trying to figure it out and just eventually shake it off and return to the conversation. So for a moment there, you disconnected from your friend. And what's more, by not asking for clarification, you've kept yourself dumb, to be honest. You missed a chance to ask a friend, Hey, what does that word mean? I never heard that word before. Please explain. And then they would only be happy to explain. Because after all, that makes them feel intelligent, that indulges their ego, so why not throw them a bone and make yourself smarter in the process and defeat your ego ever so slightly in the process. So, that's it. That's a little simple way that ego keeps you dumber in everyday life. So next time you come across something you don't understand or a word you've never heard before, 
Consider taking a moment to stop the conversation and ask your friend for clarification. You'll become smarter, they'll feel smarter, everybody wins. So that's it. That's Dissecting Ego for today. Okay, so now it's time to break into today's big, complicated topic, which is science. Oh my god, what is that thing? Hear that sound, fellow human, and learn it well. That is the sound of a nuclear bomb. Brought to you by science. A little over a year ago, my life went through a turbulent series of events that changed everything. I mean, all areas of my life and mind shifted radically. I haven't told that story in detail yet. In a way, this whole podcast is the story of that shift, uh, both my mentality before and after, parts that went into that transformation, but I haven't exactly told you about the moment of shift that happens. But it boils down to this. I was shaken and tossed out of all my mental boxes. My whole world was turned upside down and I was tossed naked into the world with nothing to hold on to. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. One of these boxes that I had been in was science. And from that point on, I could never look at science as naively again, especially considering little boo-boos like nuclear weapons. So how do you feel about science? What does it mean to you? I feel pretty safe in assuming, since this is the internet, that you love and revere it. I've noticed this trend growing in line with the development of the internet. Uh, nerds used to be marginal. Science used to be niche. But now nerds and science are king in this new mainstream culture. By all observations, science is now the dominant religion of the internet age. What's wrong? Did it strike a nerve to hear science called a religion? Well, if it did, that should probably be your first clue that it is for you. I told you season two would be a minefield for egos, so be on your toes, here come some minds. Now before I go any further or make any unnecessary enemies here, I want to make it clear that I'm not a science hater. See, like all religions, criticizing science, especially online, makes egos very twitchy. It makes people want to place the critic in a box that's anti-science or something so they can proceed to hate on that person. A uh, strike back towards what is instantly perceived as an aggressive attack on science. So before anyone succumbs to that, let me announce it here clearly. I love science, okay? My relationship with science goes way back, even to the very first memory of life. Uh, I've said in the past on the podcast that I'm an artist. The fact is, before I ever was an artist, I was a scientist first. Now, I don't mean I have a science degree, or that I work in a lab. I mean that ever since my first moment of awareness, I've been plagued by an unquenchable need to understand everything. From a young age, that was the one and only driving force in my daily existence. The one task that I was always working on. Understand, understand, understand. Uh, to see something I didn't understand would torture me. I was notorious for dissecting any mechanical toy, just to see how it worked. I usually had to do this by breaking it open, of course, uh, knowing I would never play with it again. But understanding was more important than enjoyment for me. I was willing to sacrifice the joy of a thing to satisfy understanding. I was willing to destroy a harmonious structure to gain knowledge. That is a scientist. I was a scientist first, in the same way I'm also an artist, at heart. It's stitched in the fabric of me, I can't escape this. 
It also means I've never been able to fool myself with a convenient lie to avoid a difficult truth, or even worse, to paint over science the religion's devil, the unexplainable. It's exactly this inbuilt principle that calls me to point out the problems I see in today's science. To pretend everything science is fine and dandy is a lie. There are some serious issues to face today. So now you know where these criticisms are coming from, I can continue. Point one, science the organized religion. As I already stated, today science has become the major religion for the internet age. It's also masqueraded as the religion called atheism, which holds science as the whole of its belief system. Really, both are one and the same. Science of the religion and atheism are interchangeable. So let's examine the evidence. First, I volunteer my personal experience. Think back to my earlier story about latching on to science as a child. There was a red flag there which most would have missed. Fear. I only saw it in myself once I started paying attention to the mechanics of my own ego. It boils down to this. Nature, life, the massive forces of the universe, reality itself, to become conscious among these forces is absolutely terrifying. This is the core challenge of the human experience. All of us are terrified all the time, deep down inside. Terror must be the first thing a newborn feels. Uh, think of that raw scream we all let out when first entering this world. Then as our conscious mind develops, we all latch on to something to cope with the overwhelming mystery and chaos of mere existence. We all seek some refuge from the howling monster that is reality. Some people latch on to the older religious systems like Christianity, a fortress of poetry and instinct. I latched on to science, a fortress of hard facts. Some latch on to regulation, a fortress of laws. My need to understand everything was actually the basic human fear of the unknown. I became unhealthily attached and dependent on science out of fear and desperation. The same way vulnerable people become trapped by a cult. That alone turns science into a religion, because religion can be defined as a system that humans gravitate to in order to make sense of existence and inevitable death. In itself, there's nothing wrong with that. It's only natural to gather an understanding of existence through life experience. Uh, the problem comes when the ego treats a system as a fortress against terror, instead of a rough guide for navigating it. No fortress is unshakable. Consciously or not, your ego knows that. This leads to defensive behavior when you bunker down behind shaky walls. Ask yourself, why be defensive if your fortress is perfect? A religion is a general explainer of reality which keeps away the wild winds of naked existence. It provides an illusion that we know what's going on out here, when the truth is nobody knows at all. It's a fire in the night which exists only to calm the screaming fear of the ego. The fear of death is always behind the ego's motives, so these are powerful urges to resist. And these are very tempting comforts to fall into, these fortresses of ego. But when you latch on to a system with that ego-driven fear, it turns it from an explainer of reality into a wall against reality. We all clearly see the blindness and shortcomings of other faiths and belief systems, some of which appear completely insane compared to our views. Yet when it comes to science, it somehow can't be questioned, can't be criticized. But the fact is, each one can find fault in the other because each one is faulty. Science is no exception. Science has built a wall against the unknown, and only allows in what is controllable and understood. This creates an illusion that it understands everything, but in truth it only understands what it allows itself to believe in. This is just another fairy tale. Fully aware of how much it doesn't know, science the religion usually prefers to act defensively against the unknown, rather than embracing or exploring it. And the signs are everywhere once you start looking at science as a religion. The Higgs boson particle, nicknamed the God particle, 
doesn't that hint at a different motivation for science to find a god they can accept? This is a religious motivation. Meanwhile, attacking the god of other faiths, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the current popular culture poster boy for science, uh, he said such things as, God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Now first, this is a thinly veiled, egotistical attack against all faiths of the world. It also suggests that in his mind, science takes the seat of God. So his personal savior and God is named science. This also assigns the word God to his rival, the remaining unknowns of the universe. This is what he calls this God that is being overtaken by science. His aggressive view towards it reveals a fear of the unknown, which motivated him to cling to science in the first place so defensively and egotistically. Finally, the wording, ever receding pocket, paints that age-old delusion of any moment now, science will know everything, when in fact science is a pathetically minute bubble of knowledge growing across the face of the entire universe, aka the god in that quote. It's science that should be called a pocket, not the mystery. We know barely a pinprick in the scale of existence. A more humble man wouldn't talk this way. I used to idolize Mr. DeGasse Tyson, and I see so many others still doing that, uh, until I started viewing ego as the red flag of a trapped mind. The man is dripping with ego, unfortunately. I signed up to his Twitter feed once, hoping to be fed interesting and wonderful facts about the universe. All I found was a stream of snarky attacks at people of faith, and other airs of this person is stupid, that person is stupid. Insecurity and ego were all I found there. So as I survey the landscape of outspoken and popular poster boys for science or atheism online and in media, I can't help but notice a pattern. Most of them are angry, aggressive, antagonistic, dare I even say somewhat childish. I see very few of them advocating their position from a place of joy, which suggests their position is one of insecurity, just as it used to be for me. If you want to see science well represented, look at Carl Sagan, a man who in my opinion advocated science perfectly, in a balanced way, without ego or insecurity, and most of all with an open sense of mystery. Sagan was one of those true scientific hearts that never forgot that science was only the sum of what we know so far. It seems that to him, everything was possible, which is a much more accurate view of reality. Now I can just feel it. Somewhere out there, the more I talk about this stuff, the more upset and insulted someone is becoming. To that person, thanks for listening. Stay with me now. Now pay attention to the gears turning inside yourself. Are you sure this urge to attack isn't based on insecurity? Is it because I oppose your standing saints? Shades of religion. Is it because you feel I'm calling you ignorant? I've actually only expressed empathy and understanding so far. Are you assuming that I must be illogical, ignorant, uneducated, flat out stupid? Are you sure this isn't team versus team mentality? Are you assuming I must be a religious nut, placing me in the enemy box? Are you feeling that I deserve less of your respect because of my views? Are you feeling that I need to be saved from my own ignorance before I infect others with my wrong perspective? Is that burning in your gut loaded with a sense of entitlement? Righteousness? Welcome to ego-based religion, my friend. You're in a box. I'm just trying to show you the walls. All of those reactions are calling cards of an exposed ego thrashing for pacification. Don't be so easily scared into submission. You are not your ego. You can ignore it. Your ego screaming, don't let him ruin my illusion of safety. Just like a person of faith reacts against science when it threatens their views with facts. Uh, you've judged followers of other faiths for behaving this way. Don't be a hypocrite. Be a scientist. Be a real scientist. And consider the evidence running amok inside you right now. You are unhealthily attached to science.
Science has become your religion. Now, I could speak with some authority on this defensive mentality, because as I said, I was in that box. I know it well. So how'd I get out? Well, I wasn't so lucky to have someone spell it out like this. Uh, I had to find the door myself, with a little tough love from the universe. Through good luck or bad luck, I happen to have led a life peppered with impossible things. Uh, distributed evenly throughout my life are dramatic events which science says are not possible, do not happen. But as a scientist at heart, I couldn't dismiss them. For most of my life, I've tried to minimize, deny, and rationalize these experiences. Uh, not able to properly diffuse them, I filed them away in a back drawer of my mind, earmarked as flukes or curiosities, uh, which were really just labels of desperation. Today, I could honestly say that these things terrified the hell out of me and threatened my sense of having a grip on reality. They were alarming for the same reason my words might be upsetting to some people, uh, to other boxed minds. They were shaking my fortress, showing its weak points. I would turn to my god, science, for answers, and it had no power. It even turned aggressive on me, saying I must be crazy, I must be lying, I must have imagined it. Meteor strikes from the universe still kept throwing me impact after impact of in-your-face impossibility ever since childhood. Time and time again, the universe was showing me that science wasn't a god. And it's only recently that it all reached a critical mass, the wizard's curtain fell, and I accepted the basic fact. Science doesn't know nearly everything. Science is not a complete system of truth, not even close. There are more things out there that we don't understand than the things we do. The only logical option, for me, was to abandon science as my be-all and end-all of understanding. In other words, I left the box of science. And today I'm somewhere outside the walls of science, but I still carry the best of its tools with me. So in short, I was broken out of the fortress of science, not by force, but by demonstration. The universe has flashed its secrets at me repeatedly, and I could no longer accept science's position that these experiences don't exist and are impossible because they kept happening around me. So there was only one choice, or two choices. Stop believing my own life experience, or accept the obvious fact that science doesn't know all, and the things it doesn't know can still exist. Remember that I'm a highly logical and scientific thinker. I'm not satisfied with shaky evidence. I can smell bullshit a mile away, and that's why I recognize the bullshit of science telling me that these things can exist. Now, I know that I can never convince anyone of my impossible personal experiences because I can't reproduce them. But know that it takes a lot of evidence for me to accept or declare anything. So the fact that I'm... Even declaring this means that I have been overwhelmingly convinced. My first instinct is always to explain something scientifically. It was my own logic that pulled me out of the box of science, which is the same door I'm trying to share with you now. Logic. So back to the box. It's only logical that any boxed-in position doesn't encompass everything. There's an inside and an outside to every box. A box with nothing outside it, that's a hole, W-H-O-L-E. A person in search of greater knowledge should always be looking for the boundaries of his own box and stepping through the exit. When there are no more exits, he's probably arrived. There are things outside science that exist despite science's inability to dissect them. Science's denial that they exist doesn't erase those things from reality. Historically, science has always denied and ridiculed new frontiers, only to be proven wrong soon enough. Outside truths are often regarded aggressively by the scientific establishment of the day, uh, driven by insecurity, of course. For example, uh, your own consciousness is one such thing. 
an amazing mystery that is all too often taken for granted. Awareness is still completely unexplained by science, which maintains your soul doesn't exist. Yet there you are, listening to me, I could only assume. I should make it clear here that science has developed a twin meaning in society. There is science the process, or the technique, and science the religion, the institution. I appreciate and respect science of the process. That's what I've kept with me after leaving. I agree with the concept of understanding through evidence and exploration. I agree with expecting evidence before assigning belief. That's how I live. But my issue is with science of the religion, which behaves as a refuge for cowards, a fortress, a limiter of knowledge, a resistor of change a trapper of minds. Which brings me to point two. Science, the arbiter of reality. Did you know that modern science used to be an underground resistance movement? There was a time in history when the Catholic Church had a complete monopoly on reality and knowledge in Western society. What the Church said was not only law, but the acceptable view of reality. Nothing existed that the Church didn't approve existed. For example, the sun spinning around the earth? Yeah, the church was behind that one. And then some people, born with curious minds like mine, wanted to explore the mechanics of this world and saw evidence which couldn't be ignored. These were the founders of science. The church naturally found this opposition threatening to its fortress, uh, not to mention controlling a human reality allows you to steer the humans trapped inside it. So as a result, all scientific exploration was made illegal because an alternate reality, an alternate view of reality was being formed, which opposed their control structure. So science was made illegal. This was the age of heresy. Heretics were often men of science who had to live in secrecy and crime to plant the founding seeds of modern science. For example, it was a sin against God and therefore illegal to dissect human bodies. So anatomical researchers started grave robbing at night to further knowledge of anatomy. This was the foundation of modern medicine. All branches of science, medicine, astronomy, physics, chemistry, all of those had their roots in this era of oppression and rebellion. Eventually the people did break free from the church's iron grip, and those beginnings set into motion the entire competitive dynamic between Christianity and science. A war of belief systems. A war of realities. From the very beginning, it was all about battling egos, battling world views. And to this day, that old grudge keeps things that way. Science versus all faiths. Christianity versus all faiths. Same thing. All ego. Now look at what we have today. Today, science has become the new arbiter of reality. Of course, this has never been declared outright, and there's no legal enforcement of this. But its figures and followers flaunt that attitude. To claim belief in anything outside science's approved model of reality is to be exposed to ridicule, by and large. It's become socially acceptable, even cool, to treat these humans as lesser-minded, if they dare to stray outside the laws of science. It's okay to attack people outside science, just like it used to be okay to attack anyone outside Christianity. The creation of demons. Sounds religious to me. I would argue that a mind stuck in a box is actually poorer than one which explores many views. A battle of realities between two boxed minds is as ironic as two caged birds telling each other theirs is the truer sky. Ironically, a mind that allows itself to wander out of science is more of a scientist than one entrenched in science the fortress. The one stuck in a box will never discover any new grounds. Human advancement comes thanks to people venturing outside acceptable limits of thought. So why ridicule those that do? Time to drive home the point. Science is not in charge of reality. It can never claim or act from that position until it can explain all of reality. 
Despite that eternal delusion, no, science is nowhere near that point. It is not just around the next breakthrough. Until it can explain all things, science only has a piece of the answer, just like everybody else. So far I see no signs that science is anywhere near explaining any of the meaningful human questions. What is reality? What is life? What is the universe? What is consciousness? Science still doesn't even understand why gravity happens, despite knowing everything about how it works. Which brings me to point three, science the mechanic. Science has what is called a reductionist, mechanistic view of reality. That means it thinks everything can be explained and understood by reducing it to smaller and smaller parts, with everything in existence just a set of mechanics. This might sound all well and logical, until you consider uh, some unstated implications in that view. One of the big ones is that you don't have a soul. You're nothing more than a machine. Nothing more. So how do you feel about that? Do you feel like a random result of chemical reactions? Many aspects of your body are clearly mechanical, but what about your raw awareness of experience? That unexplainable spark that we can only call a mind or a soul. The experiencer inside you that's experiencing things. Does it make sense that a clock with the right arrangement of gears would somehow become aware like you? That's what science thinks. Now, one of the founders of science used to dissect dogs alive. He once sliced off the lower tip of a living dog's heart, inserted his finger inside its beating organ, and noted his findings about the functions of the heart. One French scientist, Magandi, nailed a dog's limbs to a table, like Jesus, and dissected one half of its body while it still lived, exposing and separating out all of its nerves. Then he stopped for the day, announcing to his audience that he would finish the other half the next day, if the servants would be kind enough to keep it alive overnight. Barbaric. We hold this view today, of course. But hey, life was just a soulless machine in their eyes. That thrashing and those yelps of pain were just mechanical reflexes, right? You can do all kinds of immoral things when you decide nothing is sacred. A serial killer might have the same view of the human he kills. Does that make it okay? The truth is, science hasn't changed that position since then. It still regards all things as soulless machinery, which allows it to commit all sorts of immoral acts against life and nature. But it's all okay as long as it's for the good of humanity, right? Well, if it was socially acceptable, science would do the same thing to human beings. It was only for good PR that it holds humans and pets as exceptions to the rule, while in truth, science doesn't believe you're anything more than a set of mechanics. A dirty stain it would rather you don't think about. Now this highlights the problem in a purely reductionist, mechanistic approach to all things. Consider this example. Imagine a bunch of microbes that are also intelligent, like humans. Now place their scientists on a computer screen and ask them to explain the displayed image using only the reductionist approach. They'll start by taking the screen apart, which eradicates the image they were meant to understand in the first place. From the very start, they've already failed. The screen is going to be reduced to smaller and smaller parts, each of their functions probed and understood. Nobody panic, they'll claim, when the image disappears. Uh, we'll find the answer if you just let us keep digging. They'll feel so close to understanding the amazing mystery of screen, just in time to fall across the signal cable. And then revolution! All will be in awe of microbe science as the books are rewritten to consider a non-local signal. The image will surely be found at the other end, they'll tell us. The cable will be followed until the much more complex computer is reached. The God Box, which will also immediately be dismantled as it's explored until the computer is scattered all across the room in well-labeled bins, also wiping out the running program that had sent the image in the first place. Microbe science will have discovered so much, but will have destroyed the original mystery. No closer to understanding the image, and in fact having destroyed it forever. 
They could put the computer back together molecule by molecule. They could build a whole new computer. But the memory running the program will have been wiped forever. They'll never be able to understand the program that originally sent the image. Then a sense of emptiness sets in, filled by the assurance that more dissection will someday explain it all. The keyboard, the electrical grid, the room, the house, all will eventually be corroded away by this effort, but the image will never be found again. That's not even factoring in the completely alien, organic human which created the image in the first place. That would be a whole other unbelievable revolution. They might take the human apart too, never realizing it was a gargantuan, sentient being all along. Now your consciousness is just like an image on a computer screen. It's just like a program running on a PC. It isn't a thing. It's an event. It's happening in matter, but it isn't matter. It's made of energy, but it isn't just energy. It's something that comes about in a delicate balance of forces and just the right balance. It's so easily broken and lost into thin air, it would seem. The reductionist, mechanistic approach will never be able to find the soul or create consciousness because these aren't simply a set of mechanics. They'll scan mental processes to finer and finer degrees. They'll model it, create false reproductions of it, and call it AI. But consciousness is part of this big picture, which requires that it be appreciated and studied as it is. Not pulled apart for answers, not reproduced, just appreciated. Some things are just happenings that can never be replicated. Some things should be appreciated as they are. Everything there is to know about them, available to know in simply experiencing them. Some things are completely outside the reach of science, and always will be, because they barely exist, if at all. The soul, the meaning of life, the point of reality even existing, all of these things are like the enjoyment in a mechanical toy. Joy will never be found inside the toy. Joy is nowhere in its gears or materials. Joy doesn't materially exist, but it still happens. It was put in that toy by another intangible thing called intent. And that intent was carried into the heart of the enjoyer. A force called joy was imbued and transferred through a mechanical toy, and science can never quantify it. The beauty in a piece of art works just the same way. A creative soul intended an emotion into an object, and a viewer receives it by experiencing the object. Soul, intent, emotion, experience, mechanics like energy transference, cause and effect, all happening in a system outside the physical plane. Some things can only be understood and studied through experience. This is one of the many aspects of reality that science will never provide answers to and never understand. Ideas, inspiration, emotion, awareness, consciousness, dreams, souls, hallucinations, all of these things exist because they happen, but they can never be captured. Science can explain their mechanics but cannot explain them. And many of these things I listed steer and create our world, yet somehow we consider them non-real. Why? Because science hasn't nailed them down. They exist on another plane, which manifests in the physical world, but somehow doesn't reside in it. Science understands by reducing matter, so it will always be limited from understanding these things which originate beyond matter. A computer program can't be understood by breaking down a computer and understanding electricity. The program itself can only be understood by using the computer. The program doesn't really materially exist. You can dissect the universe and decode all of its mechanics, but you will not understand life or experience in any way but by living and by existing. There are other layers of reality which float on top of the physical universe, like a program. Science is woefully inadequate when it comes to this stuff. 
Now the point is, science, being a reductionist, mechanistic thinker, has massive blind spots, and it will never explain everything. The best you can hope for is that it will someday explain all of the physical universe. It isn't even close to understanding that. It is and forever will be just a part of the answer, not the one and only authority. To treat it like a savior, like a religion, like the only source of human knowledge, is as short-sighted as assuming a mechanic can drive a car better than everyone else. A mechanic only understands the construction of the car, can build them and fix them. Nothing in his experience guarantees he has more driving skill or a sense of direction. Science will always only know the how of things, not the why of them. Even when it has reached every corner of the universe, it'll only know how the universe works, not what it is or why it is. Having decoded all the details of the human mind, it'll still not be able to explain your awareness, much less the why of it. Look to science for how things work, nothing more. That's its proper place. Point four, science the controller, the destroyer. I touched on it already. Science understands by dissolving holes, W-H-O-L-E-S. Just like I destroyed my toys as a young boy, science is a well-intended monster. It's important to remember this. It's a weakness of character that we as a human society don't keep it accountable to nearly enough. And when we don't, boom. nuclear bomb. Then there's the matter of what science does with its acquired knowledge. A lot of terrible things are done and created for the sake of advancing scientific knowledge. But what happens then? Science has very unhealthy urges of control. Science is a religion born out of the human urge to control the universe, not simply understand it. Where other religions aimed to explain the terrible forces of life, uh, find a way to get along with and navigate them, science has always been an urge to make them bend to human control. That demonstration of power is what impresses most people into joining it as followers. That's why so many people who seem to take science as a religion feel so superior to other religions because science as a religion appears to create miracles on demand. The control impulse is smeared all over science's actions and principles. Uh, take for example the principle of something doesn't exist until it can happen under laboratory conditions, aka controlled conditions. By this rule then, all things that can't be reproduced or produced on demand don't exist. Only things that we can control exist. As I said earlier, that's a little box reality where only what's controllable is allowed to exist. What about things outside the walls? Things that only occur once and never again. What about things that don't come when they're called, but only manifest when and where they choose to? By the principles of science, these things don't exist even if they do. This is a kind of paradox, a, a denial that's necessary when living in a fortress of fantasy. There's a line in Star Wars Episode 2. This smug librarian lady tells Obi-Wan, if something does not appear in our records, it does not exist. In the end, she was wrong. This is the kind of denial in science's expectation that if something doesn't perform or appear on command, it doesn't exist. Some things will never come under that kind of control. Let me be fair, though. If you look at science as a quest of gathering the list of things we can prove to be true, then I don't blame it for that rule, and I completely agree with that view of science. What I'm criticizing is the position that if science can't catch something, it can't exist. 
That's an aspect of science, the religion. It's a deluded mentality. Still, across all the angles of science, I maintain that science is out to control the universe. How many times does science realize it has power and then doesn't exercise it? How many scientists are happy with understanding something without testing it? The shiny image of science is that it's the pursuit of knowledge. My point is that the intent under that is actually power and control. And under all of that is fear of reality. I'm just pointing this out for the sake of awareness and caution. It's important to be aware of these things. Point number five. Science, the infallible, unstoppable juggernaut. Science is the most dangerous religion in history. It's a religion with nuclear bombs, bioweapons, drone warfare. It facilitated man's severance from nature, making the destruction of nature seem less alarming, a self-perpetuating cycle that ends with the collapse of mankind. It crosses lines of morality and wisdom with impunity, tossing the masses' trinkets to validate its trespasses and sins against life. It stuck its fingers inside all the organs and machinery of the delicate systems of nature, gone so far as to seek editorial power over the most ancient thread of existence, DNA. All along the way, it's pointed out the good it has done for us, curing disease, giving us iPads and air conditioning. But it's time to face the truth. It has always come at a destructive price that most often is greater than the benefits. Now, all too often, that's ignored. Nuclear knowledge brought us nuclear bombs. Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Islands. Does chemotherapy balance that out? Considering that might also give you more cancer? Antibiotics has brought us resistant strains of bacteria that now make them useless. The combustion engine has brought us global warming, pollution, increased rates of illness, all kinds of issues with oil spills. Uh, we're always reminded that science solves all problems. How often is it also pointed out that science creates most of them in the first place? My point is that some things should be held sacred, such as DNA. There is a place for holding things sacred. Some Pandora's boxes should never be opened such as nuclear power. Humanity was nowhere near wise enough to gain nuclear power. It's even less prepared to manipulate the web of life. But science, the unstoppable and fallible, will charge forward anyway, unencumbered. It's the runaway ruling church of our day, which must never be impeded. We can do it, therefore we will. To hell with the consequences, science can solve any problem we create. Anyone that speaks against us is a heretic, by the way. It's a severely flawed, ironic, and egotistical perspective. Science, right now, has more funding globally than any other branch of human development, which reflects the false view that it's the only provider of truths. Where is the funding for arts, spiritual advancement, philosophy, consciousness expansion, evolution of just the way we think and look at the world, uh, studies in living with nature instead of fighting against it, and so forth? Where is the department in society that reminds us to live and to wonder at the simple existence of existence? Where is the class in school that reminds our kids that their own exploration of life is as important as the bank of shared human understanding we're cramming down their throat like gospel? The fact is, none of these things serve an insecure ego as well as science does, because none of these provide weapons, control, or destructive power to people like governments. A government, like every other institution, acts like a large-scale human, reflecting the minds of the humans that run it. The vast majority of people in power today are insecure, unbalanced, undisciplined egos, a product of this same unbalanced society. So all funding is, of course, funneled into the advancement of science, this religion that supplies control over the material universe. What we have as a result is a society with more science than its humans are ready to control, a society full of knowledge but little wisdom in applying it. A society devoid of spirit, wonder, passion, where everything is thought to be understood and boring. 
Still, we continue to forge ahead, funneling most human energy into science with the illogical and flawed idea that it'll somehow provide all the answers, all the meaning, all solutions before the same imbalance destroys us. Yes, I'm getting off on a bit of a rant, but I really believe in this stuff. I really, I really think these are important opinions to highlight because way too often in, in, in our society today, there is this whole unquestioning trust and mad dash towards science that, that is going to lead to problems and already has. So what am I saying? Uh, stop all science? Well, what if I am? Consider that new science brings at least as many problems with it as its benefits, uh, which would mean that they cancel each other out, right? In that case, continuing the mad dash for science is doing nothing except adding more complexity to the world, making it that much harder to correct problems. What I'm saying is maybe we should take a break, humanity. Maybe we should take it easy on scientific advancement for a generation or two, and focus those minds on fixing the damage and problems we have right now. I mean, we've been running on this path since the early ages of mankind, and I'm pretty sure at this point, we're safe from the lions. We could take a breath. Maybe it's smart to spend some time catching up as people before we gain the power to make black holes. Maybe we should all calm down and try to see how science can help us live with the universe instead of trying to beat it back with an ever fancier stick. And if we don't slow it down, then maybe it's time to massively speed up the taming of the human ego. I mean, that's what I'm working on anyway. If you ask me, the guiding principles of humanity need updating a lot more urgently than science does. Science is already in the future. It's time to let humanity and societies catch up from medieval mentalities. Or before you know it, even the smartest of us will be a monkey piloting a machine we don't understand. So let's stop enshrining science as a religion. Start treating it as it should be, as a set of tools some tools should never be built. Some tools can only destroy. There should be a conversation about slowing down or even halting certain branches of science until other issues have caught up. Mainly the issue of human ego, as I said, and ego-driven governments which turn all new knowledge into weapons. Do we really need more technology as we stand? Do we really need antimatter weapons? Nanomachines? Brain integration technology, master control over all DNA. Slow down, humanity. Catch your breath. You've left something behind. Take time to look where you're going, humanity, before you step off a cliff. So, how can we possibly do that? Start by digesting everything I just said. If I freed a few minds today from the fortress of science, we're a few steps closer to that. And I'll say it again, I love science. I would hate to be born in an era without it. It served me very well, it has inspired me. Science deserves our respect as an invaluable human tool. But I can't stay silent about the problems I see in people adopting it as a religion. Science has become enshrined and untouchable, and it's time to put it back in a proper light. Science doesn't work for the good of humanity. It works for its own satisfaction. If it really worked for the good of humanity, we would see our health and energy problems solved before the next major weapons technology. Now I won't hold my breath on that. The climate change problem would be top priority instead of dead last, because it threatens the future of all human endeavor, including the expansion of knowledge. So, don't base your worldview on science alone. It's forever partially blind. That's just the nature of the thing. Don't look to science to answer the mysteries of existence, because it'll never grasp them. Don't pin your heart and soul on science, because it doesn't even believe in your soul. Respect science for what it is, a long-term human project called Decode Material Mechanics. Something to draw wisdom from, but definitely not something to base a life on. Answers about the human experience come in pieces, from every corner of human experience. No one box 
is wholly right, just like no one box is wholly wrong. Someone listening out there must be wondering, then what the heck are you, if not a scientist, not an atheist, not a religious nut, etc.? Well, first of all, that's a question from an ego, who wants to define me as a friend or a foe. But if you must know, today, I'm a wild man in the jungles of existence. I'm a traveling truth merchant that frequents all towns. I'm a freer of minds, a crusher of fortresses. Enemy to all boxes in myself or in view. I'm a conscious soul battling the trappings of ego and fear. I am the shaman in the woods. I'm the hermit in a cave. I am a branch that bends with the winds of reality. I am a wild animal making love to existence without a condom. I'm alive. I'm a being in a human, exploring the human experience as nakedly as I can. I'm the spirit of freedom and wonder. To the bird in a cage, I'm a bird in a tree, singing, your gates are yet open, fly free. Be brave and fly free, fellow human, of whichever box you're in. Define reality yourself, and give value to your own experience. Consider creating your own worldview, your own personal image of reality based on the best of science, the best of experience, philosophy, spirituality, art, love, any other tool you find value in. What you'll find will be worth more than anything any one book or faith can deliver. Don't depend only on rigid institutions to deliver your truths. Go outside and find some yourself. Feel around in the darkness out there and rediscover your long-lost inner light. Eventually you'll learn the resonance of real truth, and all around you, fortresses will begin to fall. Ah, well, that was a big one. Thank you so much for sticking through it. I really hope you found some gems in this pile of words. Now, if you found these criticisms interesting at all, and you want to challenge yourself to think about it further, I highly suggest the book Science Set Free, a book by Rupert Sheldrake, who is one of these open-minded scientists that seems to be able to reach conclusions and formulate theories that seem ahead of their time just because he is not stuck in the box of science. And I assume he had the same kind of awakening I did because his book, Science Set Free, does a much more professional job of pointing out so many of the same issues I have pointed out uh, in a really well put together way that I just couldn't help but nod the whole time I was listening to it as an audiobook. Uh, so do check it out, Science Set Free, great book. And if Mr. Sheldrake happens to hear this one day, hey, call me. I would love to talk to you. Next, look forward to some discussions about the scientifically impossible, including my insane experiences in the Amazon rainforest. But before I go, I'd like to make an open invitation to any listener out there that still has a burning problem with something I said on this or any other episode, contact me. To anyone that has a burning desire to have a conversation about any episode, good or bad, contact me. Are you any good at expressing your thoughts? Join me on the podcast. I'd love to have a discussion. Also, you can always leave a comment or rating on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe there or on iTunes. Check out higherideas.net for all links, show notes, contacts, and now a brand new blog where the text of this episode will be available for your bloggy, eyeballing pleasure. So, this has been I, broadcasting from somewhere outside the box, probably still inside a bigger box. Until next time, keep thinking.